Please, um, I know you're several. You're finishing up dinner. Uh, I would remind everyone that dessert will be after the play plenary session. So uh, uh, we wanted to get started. I have a few announcements to make. Um, I'm Dick Kolka. I'm president of APOR this year. I wanted to personally welcome you to the uh, this facility. Uh, it's been a long time getting here. We've had some bumps in the road. Uh, as many of you know, we um, were scheduled for a different hotel for the, originally about a year out. We were able to get this hotel, but we're very pleased with the facility we were able to get for you, and I hope that you will all enjoy both the facility and maybe the weather. Uh, but, and the conference uh, program itself is spectacular. And I, I hope you'll agree. Uh, I want to... Uh, I'm not going to make announcements about the program. I'm going to leave that to Michael Link and to uh, about the hotel and other things to the AMP staff, as well as, well as the uh, conference operations staff. But I, I, I did have a major an, uh, announcement to make tonight, one, or a couple. One is several of you uh, had uh, planned to go to the Lou Harris Heritage Series today. And I think many of you may know this, but I wanted to make sure that you all know this, that Lou had uh, fallen and been taken to the emergency room very shortly before that was scheduled. He's going to be staying overnight, but my understanding is that he's doing fine and that they expect him to be fine. But we did have to cancel that session. <clears throat> uh, Mark Blumenthal did, uh, was able to have a, uh, a video uh, session with him on his blog. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to bring Lou back into the fray and he's one of the clear stars and historically of our profession, and we're definitely going to try to bring him back into the thing. Uh, the second thing I wanted to announce today is a major change that we're making in APOR this year. Uh, you, you've seen the logo on the screen uh, and on your program about change, and you're going to hear change a lot over this conference. A lot of <clears throat> changes have been taking place, some of them small, some of them large. The one change we're making is we are uh, is a change in our uh, association management uh, group. Uh, we uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the process, although be, we will certainly let all members know about uh, these issues as they come along. But we are going to be changing later this year to another management association. In a minute, I'm going to introduce uh, one person from that. But what I want to do now is to recognize the staff from Applied Measurement Professionals, Inc. Most of you don't even know what Applied Management Professionals, Inc. is. Uh, you know these staff as APOR staff. They're part of us. They've been part of us for many years, and we owe them a great deal. I want to take a minute to go back. Uh, I was conference chair I, I, in the other side of Florida, in St. Pete Beach, in the 2002 conference, which is a memorable conference for a lot of reasons. One reason was is that it was the first conference we had after 9-11, and we were spent a lot of time trying to figure out if anybody could go to that conference. Fortunately, we did get everybody to that conference, and uh, we had we had prior to that conference we had done we had been ran, running our conference operations and our management out of Ann Arbor with a part-time staff member. Many of you will remember Marlene Bednars and a few students helping us. We moved, uh, that, that's when we did, we decided to bring in applied measurement professionals, <clears throat> and they've shown us what a professional association can do to help an organization like us. They've taken us from barely be able to do the doggy paddle to be able to do the backstroke and to swim in all the different moves and to, without a beat, miss some of the more complex uh, challenges of running a conference and running an organization year in, year out. And uh, we owe them a great deal for that. They brought us to a level that I would have thought we might never reach. Uh, we are going to a new phase, and we've been, uh, we're, we're going to try to go to an, uh, an additional level, but I particularly want to recognize the staff that are here. I want to ask the three staff that are here to come up for a moment, because I want to recognize them specifically. So. Um, uh, Kristen and uh, Melissa and Monica, could you come for a minute? <clears throat> I want, I want you and me on the line. 
Kristen Povolonis has, uh, essentially she's grown up with me in the role as I came in as president. Uh, Kristen joined us last year. We announced her as, as, as she came in uh, as the uh, associate, or excuse me, the executive coordinator for A4. She's done a phenomenal job. I've enjoyed immensely working with her, and she's helped continue and go beyond what we have done before. She's been with us through 2007 to 2009 as executive coordinator, and I want to give her one uh, thank you for your session. Melissa, Melissa Whitaker is, is our meeting manager. She goes through all the headaches of hotel selection along with our conference operations people, Linda and Dave and others. Um, she's the one who found us this hotel. So if you enjoy it, you owe a lot to Melissa. And she's been with us from 2007 to 2009, but it seems like longer than that. We've really enjoyed it. And we want to thank you a great deal for doing this for us. And then there's Monica. What can I say about Monica? Monica has been with us since the beginning. She didn't come to our conference, as she reminded me, in, in St. Beach, but at least she was there in spirit. Because when we, even when we were there, they were talking about Monica all the time. Monica has been our association manager, and I would say, in many ways, Monica has had more interaction with you that are members than probably anybody in the association. She probably knows more of you by first name than I do. Uh, she loves APOR, and APOR loves her, and we're going to miss her a great deal. And uh, I, Monica has been with us from 2002 to 2009, the entire time we're working with her. So we know her as being AMP. And we will always think of her as one of us. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> and thank you all for your effort. And uh, we're going to miss you. And it's a difficult thing when we make these changes. But we're going to always think of you as part of us. Thank you. <clears throat> and then also, uh, let's say, Gregor. Are you off on the wing here somewhere? I wanted to introduce, uh, oh, excuse me, uh, John Waxman, who is the president of the Sherwood Group. The Sherwood Group is the group that is going to be working with us. Is John? Okay. I wanted to introduce you to John because John is here observing today, or these last couple of days, trying to understand us as a, as a group. And so you'll see him going in and out of our sessions. He may be talking to you about things, and you're certainly welcome to talk to John about these things. John, as I mentioned, is the vice, is the president of the Waxman or the Sherwood Group in Deerfield, Illinois, and they will be taking over the organization later this summer. Uh, we're working very hard on an effective transition, uh, and we'll be putting more information out to you about this. Uh, those are all the announcements I had to make tonight. And I thank you for your well for coming. Uh, we've, we've so far weathered the flu, we've weathered the economy, and we weathered changes in hotel. And I think this is going to be a spectacular event, and I'm looking forward to working with all of you to make this happen. And thank you again for the AMP staff. And uh, be sure, I, I didn't get to say, is to be, be sure to, to uh, express your own uh, Gratitude to the staff for what they've done for each of you individually. Uh, we're now going to move into the plenary session.
So what does it mean? In particular, what does it mean for us? Thank you. Welcome to Hollywood, Florida. 64th annual conference of, uh, of APOR here. My name is Michael Link. I'm the conference chair this year. My thanks to uh, Vince Price, who uh, is off doing something else. Uh, more exciting. More on that later. Um, but I will be facilitating tonight's uh, discussion. Our conference theme this year focuses on public choices in changing times. We see change in m many of the aspects of our professional and personal lives. Uh, the economic downturn, the global challenges to the major transformations that we're seeing in society and communication, the ways in which we obtain information, and the ways in which we wind up using information. Consider this, this time last year, APOR had zero presence on any of the social uh, networking sites. As of today, we have 413 fans of the APOR uh, Facebook site. Yeah, those of you in here, you know who you are. 301 members of the APOR LinkedIn site, and I do indeed like the name of that site, so. And in a growing flock of tweeters, many of whom are sitting by you right now, tweeting this very uh, session. So what does this all mean, though, in terms of change for the survey industry? For APOR, and probably more importantly, for you and I, as we're out there doing our, our work day in, day out in this particular industry. Well, in tonight's session, we want to take a deep dive into some of these and related issues. Our plenary session is entitled The Role of Traditional Survey Research in the World of, Economic, or of Electronic Measurement and Changing Information Needs. Uh, focusing on the extent and rapidity of the change in the fields of behavior, attitude measurement, and public opinion, and really looking at what do these types of changes really mean for us and the way we go about doing our work day in, day out. To help us navigate these waters and explore some of the rocks and deep channels as they were, uh, we have two very distinguished uh, speakers this evening. Paul Donato of the Nielsen Company and Kenneth Pruitt of Columbia University. Both have spent considerable portions of their careers thinking about and preparing organizations for confronting future challenges and turning these potential roadblocks into opportunities. I've asked them both to speak um, from their perspectives about what they think uh, the future holds for us in this particular world. Uh, then we're going to open it to the floor for what I hope will be a very lively, spirited discussion. And as Dick mentioned, we are holding dessert on y'all until we finish this session. So that will be out uh, where we had the reception earlier. Uh, first, we're gonna hear from Paul Donato. Paul is Executive Vice President and Chief Research Officer for the Nielsen Company. His responsibilities include integrating all research functions within Nielsen and exploring new ways to measure media audiences and consumer behavior in a changing, converging media environment. Prior to joining Nielsen, he served as president and chief executive officer of Kantar Media Research and has held senior research positions at Audits and Surveys Worldwide and Simmons Market Research Bureau. His areas of expertise include research development for television, print, and internet. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Donato. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks, it's great to be here. I'd like to say this table has soul right here. Uh, let's see, I do need these. I'm sorry, I, I uh, am in the demographic group that uh, must rely on these now. Uh, so let's go. So, survey research. I always thought of survey research as the science of asking questions. And I suppose my fundamental thesis today is that you don't have to be scientists of listening or you don't have to be scientists of watching, but you really need to partner with those people who are doing listening and watching. Now, if you don't know what listening and watching is, you will by the end of this uh, presentation, but I'm sure if you're Twittering and you're Facebooking, you know exactly what that means. My apologies. Michael told me to be provocative, so that's what I've done. Uh, this is a quote from Kim Dedeker. Kim was head of uh, Global Insights at Procter & Gamble up to just a couple of weeks ago. And while she didn't actually say research would be dead in 2012, she did say it would be on life support. And why did she say this? I think we've got to ask ourselves how advertisers got disillusioned with research over the past couple of years. So to do that, <laughs> 
Let's go back in time a little bit. Uh, Michael, I got a question for you. This is census for $50. Uh, in what year did the census first use mail to collect demographics as part of the decennial census? Me? Or you? Oh, man. <laughs> I just want you to know I gave Michael the answer I know you before this. I gave the slides the other day. <laughs> okay. there's, there's a hint on the slide. It's 1960. I, I don't um, have my teleprompter. It's 1960, in me, so. and Michael's observations were that the census started in 1790, and they didn't use mail to collect demographics until 1960, so 170 years before we used mail. Um, look at this quote. You'll recognize the authors. By the late 1960s, however, uh, the cost of personal visits were escalating while at the same time the proportion of homes with televisions had grown to close to 90 percent. Furthermore, the decline in response rates to face-to-face -face surveys made the possibility of using telephones as a mode of data collection more attractive. Advances in telephone survey methodology. Um, many of our friends are up there. I sometimes wonder with all those professors how many poor undergraduate students had to purchase this book. <laughs> But if, you will permit, if the authors will permit me to paraphrase them uh, just a little bit. Uh, by the year 2002, however, the costs of telephone were escalating, while at the same time the proportion of homes with internet had grown to over 60%. Furthermore, the decline in response rates for telephone surveys made the possibility of using internet as a mode of data collection more attractive. Oh, and then there's that tiny little issue of cell phones. So, what was history here? Um, as I recall it, around the year 2000, uh, many of the major advertisers were admonishing us for not benefiting from the rapid turnaround and cost advantage of using online surveys. But then just eight years later, um, it seems like the bottom fell out. Uh, advertisers were seeing a dramatic difference between RDD samples and online surveys. And in fact, um, there's a really celebrated case, I, I don't know if you've heard about it, it was in consumer packaged goods, where a major advertiser ran a test. 12 new product introductions, um, measured both with online and RDD. And of the 12, they got different answers in six of them. In six out of 12, they would have uh, introduced the product if they used one form of research and not introduced the product if they used the other form of research. So it's, it's no surprise that there is a kind of a crisis of confidence uh, in research. And we know what the issues were with RDD, and sitting at the dinner table, I understand there's a large number of people in the room who use RDD, who are committed to it, and who believe in modeling solutions to the components of the uh, population that you miss with RDD. From Nielsen's point of view, we um, just last year, switched our diary service over to address-based sampling. And I know this is a, an important issue in this conference, there's at least three sections on address-based sampling. Just to share some experiences, it was, it was difficult, it was painful, but at the end of the day, we felt it was very worth it. Um, you can see in the demographics that you get back on address-based sampling, um, there are people there that we are missing with RDD sampling. That said, I don't wanna say that RDD um, I don't, want, I don't want to give any kind of prognostication on RDD. Um, certainly there are modeling corrections, there are sample data cor uh, corrections, uh, but we as a large company um, doing a lot of work have been very satisfied with the shift. Online um, has a completely different set of problems. And it was this sort of simultaneously uh, online and um, RDD together that created an environment in which new methodologies, I think, found a much easier time to spring up. Um, online, uh, our people uh, think it's a, a feeding frenzy. Um, we all know the issues with professional respondents, um, the saying that 95% of all internet surveys are done by 5% of the population. I don't know if that's true or not, but I do think that good things are happening. Um, many companies in this room I know are doing research on respondent duplication and overlap uh, I know at the end of this conference, there's a uh, committee meeting. Um, APOR has its own council on online and is presenting, I think, its first results. I can't wait to see that. Uh, a few months ago, the Advertising Research Foundation presented the results of its first uh, R&D on the, I'll call it the online problem, because it is a problem. And uh, basically what the ARF did was to get together 17 panel providers, research companies, and got them all to dedicate uh, samples, subsamples. They um, 
it says hashed addresses. That's something they do to kind of protect the uh, privacy. Uh, and they started mailing surveys t uh, to these 600,000 addresses. And what they found was a couple of things. Um, one, that there was about 41% of the addresses within this community of samples that were on at least uh, two panels, and 19% were on four or more panels. Now, to be honest, I don't know whether that's good or bad. I know that 95% of all internet respondents coming from 5% of the population is probably bad, but this is just a measure of, of among 17 panels how much overlap there is. When they presented this at their annual conference, they also presented another slide um, which suggested that 25% 25, 25 of survey responses online are actually duplicates. Duplicate means that it's the same person doing multiple surveys coming back. Since then, they've pulled that back and they believe that very high number, 25%, was a consequence of this massive sample frame. If you have 17 providers within that sample frame, uh, online respondents have so many chances of getting an invitation it really raises the probability that bad people will be more, more likely to send in two surveys. A typical online survey, like, like if, if we use outsourced data, um, we'll use three, four, or five, not 17. So what that is doing is sort of toning down the expectations of how bad the worst could be. It's not 25%, but it's probably 5%, and it could be a little bit higher, uh, 10%. And so that's a problem. And what I'd like to do now, that, that's sort of gets us up to uh, the history of where we are now. This is a, a sort of a short history of asking up to this point. Now I'd like to talk about where we're gonna go uh, on each of these elements. And I put, I put the census in there just because it's feel good. So 2010, good luck, Bob Groves. 2010, uh, for the first time, the census will be using PDAs. And to Michael's observation that it took 170 years to use mail, it only took 50 years to use PDAs. Um, but you know as well as I, there's, there's so much politics associated with the census, and I'm, I'm in, a, in a job that actually sees its fair share of uh, politics, so um, I really do mean good luck to Bob. And congratulations on PDAs in the census, that's landmark. But now let's go to, um, let's go back to phone. So that's how we got to where we are in phone. What's gonna happen next in phone? Couple of things. I think um, I think ABS will continue to grow. You know as well as I that RDD is going to continue to miss a larger and larger proportion of the population. I don't know it, but I think that the RDD diehards will figure out ways of transitioning. And I think for the next couple of years, um, telephone research will continue to be healthy and happy. The bigger question I have, and we'll come back to this at the end of the presentation is do you, do you think, where, where do you think we're gonna be in 10 years? Given the fact that um, smartphones, mobile handsets collect voice, you can call them just like you can call uh, uh, a landline. Um, voice, data, you can have people, there's a, a person using a stylus to check off a box. Um, I'm gonna share with you some research projects that we've run which I felt were, were fantastic, so the question I'm gonna leave you with is, in 10 years, do you think that we'll be taking back more information from landlines, or do you think we'll be taking back more information from mobile handsets? Uh, and then finally, online. So just to get the flow, I sort of put it all out there, I'd kind of tell you how we got here and where we're gonna go next, and then get you into what I think the real technology of the future will be. Um, online, it's not going away. We do three million domestic online surveys per year. We probably come in contact with over 20 million domestic households. We do 10 million um, totally internationally. Online is just too inexpensive relative to other modes, um, and it's just too fast and too overnight other to other, uh, relative to other modes than to be not used as a major part of marketing and consumer and public opinion research. I do think the frenzy is gonna go away. Um, and I think that, we can pop the screen up there, great. Um, I think it's gonna go away because um, we are, a number of cooperatives are all engaged in finding or implementing methods for tagging households uh, so that we can control the duplication problem, we can control the overlap problem, 
Um, that icon there is just a, a little symbol from what we call a consolidated panel, panel effort within Nielsen, which basically means um, anytime anybody does a Nielsen survey, um, we tag you, we know when you come back to us, we have a very prescribed order uh, in terms of when we will serve you um, what surveys. We're not going to serve somebody a television survey after they've done something else because the television samples are really amongst the pure samples that we have, but it's a, it's a very controlled way of doing it. I think that's kind of a model for how the whole industry uh, will be moving. You've probably heard of Peanut Labs and there's other companies like them that are trying to do that on a cooperative basis. So um, online will find a way. Um, but what also happened with online, online and RDD are both sort of kind of we're losing their shine in the last couple of years, is that fact, I think, um, gave an opportunity to new forms of research, the forms that you have to figure out how to partner with. Uh, and one of them is listening. So for example, let me just turn my page here. Um, these French women uh, are saying uh, that they want bread. Listening has always been an important part of uh, public opinion research. This first lady uh, doesn't seem to listen, and we all know how this story worked out. Roll forward 250 years, uh, and um, we just recently launched a project uh, in another economic environment, which is uh, very crisis-oriented. And that, that program uh, uses listening to tell the administration, essentially, when representatives say things about policy statements, how do the media treat them, and then how does that ultimately impact uh, consumers' attitude and consumer spending and therefore the economy, especially from the short term. So let me illustrate it this way. Here we have the venerable Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index. I'm sure there's many people in the room who either work on it or know a lot more about it than I do. Just by way of background, index of 100 was December 1964. In this decade, for the most part, it was around the 90s. I think as probably 2000 was the last time I was ever at 100. Let's compare it to the Dow. Um, I could have done a correlation coefficient. Obviously, there's going to be a, a reasonable correlation there because both are going down over time. Um, it's important to know that those flat lines are there on uh, Michigan's index because it's a monthly statistic, of course. But now, let me add listening. So in green, we have um, what we call gross rating points for cable news networks. Basically, it's a measure of how much news people are consuming. And then the spiky thing in blue is Buzz. What is Buzz? It's one of our services. We basically put, put out 100,000 spiders and robots on the net at night. It crawls and looks at all the blogs and all the chat rooms and basically takes back what people are saying on the internet uh, by the morning. And it's kind of hard to make sense of this chart until you start putting um, the events over it. So that very first, um, I guess, annotation where it says Obama and McCain nominated, those are obviously the nominations. And you can see there was a much stronger interest uh, in news. The Dow at that time was flat, didn't really react. Um, it's kind of hard to read what consumer sentiment meant. And there actually wasn't that much uh, in the way of uh, blog traffic at the time. But look a couple of weeks later. Um, AIG, Black Monday, you see a lot of news uh, viewing. What's also really important is the news viewing was much higher for several weeks. News cycles on television last several weeks, much longer than internet. News cycles on internet turn on a dime. Uh, news cycles on television last longer because they've got capital, they've got to send reporters, they've got cameras, and it's hard to go to Duluth for a day to do a single story, whereas an internet you can blog for a day and then move on to something else. Um, that was the start of the, the long slide of the stock market from about 11.5 down to about 9,000. And then go to the mother of all buzz events, the election. A um, lot of news coverage, um, a lot of buzz, tremendous amount of buzz, very short-term buzz, but look at the Dow tucked underneath it. Um, buzz in the Dow and even news watching are either positively or negatively correlated, and they're picking each other up within the course of a week. Um, the inauguration, you may, may remember the facts of the inauguration. Um, it got buzzed, not as much as the election. Um, there was more, more news viewing. It didn't help the Dow any, and if you remember, that's because the inaugural speech was a very sobering speech. 
And when we're in um, D.C. and we're talking to agencies about this, the thing that seems to excite them the most is um, that last annotation. Uh, that is in February. It's the first press conference. It's Geithner. It's the stimulus package. It, there's a, a very statistically significant but small increase in news watching. There's definitely more buzz. But there's also a, an uptick, uptick uh, for a short period of time, for a couple of days in the Dow. So what I'm saying is that there are elements to listening, data which are out there without ac actually asking questions, which are correlated with events such as people's behavior in the stock market. These are very short-term events. We're not using listening to tell people how to set policies because policies are long-term. We're using listening to tell people things like what words to say, um, what they should expect to see in the next couple of days. If they say something, will people be more likely to go to the store in a week or two weeks? Let me tell you a little bit more about how Buzz works. Uh, buzz, uh, the blue line is volume. That's basically how much chatter there is. And this is an example about um, automakers. The red line is what we call sentiment. So buzz can be positive or negative. And you have, know how the software works. You've been using it in newspapers for years to do content analysis. What are they saying? How much are they saying? Is it positive or negative? It's some linguistic uh, uh, analysis. You can see the bumps up for the car makers in the middle there. That is, um, you, you know what that is. The first bump is travel by private jet. The second bump is travel by minivan. <laughs> you can see the ne very negative sentiment, what people thought about that. Um, what's very interesting, though, is that dip on the left. Oops, let me, I went the wrong way there. Yeah, the dip on the left, where there's not a lot of chatter. There's not a lot of people talking, but it's really negative. That's typical of a local plant closing. So 500 people get laid off. They don't have enough to empower the net, but the few people who are talking are really, really negative about it. Another way you use listening, um, hope versus fear. During the spring, our CEO, Dave Calhoun, traveled around and met a lot of CEOs around the country. country. And he brought back to us the fact that everyone was, was asking hope and fear. How, why are people so afraid, and how do we get them talking about hope? And so what we've done here is to take a look at blogs, chat, um, where various keywords were used, such as Great Depression and Recession and Unemployment. Fear is the dark bar. Hope is the blue bar. And you can see for almost anything dealing with the economy, when people talk about, let's say, unemployment, economy, mortgage, stocks, they're more likely to use the word fear than they are hope. There's only one word that we found where people are more likely to use the word hope than fear, and that is consumer spending. What are the implications of that? Well, if you're writing a speech, get the words consumer spending in that speech. You may remember during the, the Carter years, um, I forget the name of his treasury secretary, but he wasn't allowed to use the word recession. He started to use the word banana in these speeches, and every time he used the word banana, everybody knew he was talking about the, uh, the word recession, but he couldn't use the word recession. Um, so, we can ask people what's important to them and, uh, you know, what's on their mind and what are they thinking, or we can just study it based on what they put in the public domain. So, for example, this is the week of September 7th, and you know how word clouds work. The font size is an indication of how much chatter there is and how much important it is. And right after the uh, convention, Obama dominated, but jobs, depression, economic uh, recovery is still there. The next week, September 14th, the crisis is emerging, depression getting bigger, economic getting bigger. Obama is sort of shrinking into the landscape of concerns. Next, September 28th, bailouts got the same airtime that Obama does. Um, then, week in November 2nd, it's all Obama. You can barely find economy on the web. And then, of course, by March 1st, March 1st, rather, um, we're back to economy, depression, economic, President and Obama. So these are very visual ways of expressing people's public opinion. Um, it's unobtrusive. Um, there is, I'm going to qualify it. This is the opinion of people who elect to go to chat rooms and blogs. So that's a, a smaller portion of the population, a smaller but significant portion of the population. My, I was telling everybody at the table, my daughter graduated from NYU yesterday, and um, A, they had the ceremony in Yankee Stadium, B, 
Hillary Clinton uh, did the keynote address. And in that keynote address, she basically looked at the 14,000 graduates and thanked them for their Twittering, for their social networking, for really being the difference in the election. And I know that that's a complex statement to make, and, but people just let it slide, and they got it. They're, you know, the, the social network factor was very important in the last election in mobilizing a, a select group. So if you're gonna study that group, and it, it's really, you know, think about RDD. This is the group most likely to have cell phones. So when I say partner with listeners, you don't have to be a listener. I'm saying take a look at all available information out there, and if you think that you're missing Latinos and African Americans and young people, because they're more likely to have um, uh, cell phones and landlines, then think about partnering people to fill in those spaces. Okay, lastly, let's go to watching. Uh, watching is looking at what people are doing rather than listening to what they, were say they are saying. And so here's a, a photograph of um, essentially one form of electronic ethnography. On the right, you have uh, a graduate student from Ball State University. She's holding a computer. These computers are especially designed to take back feedback every 10 minutes, every 10 seconds, rather. Um, we, this study was done by something called the Council for Research Excellence. They have a website called researchexcellence.com. That domain name was available to us about 18 months ago, pity. Uh, I strongly recommend that you go there because the whole study is up on, on this. It's qualitative, it's not quantitative. But it produced um, some really remarkable information. We did not do the study, we funded the study. Um, on behalf of our clients. Our clients actually, we have this foundation called the Council for Research Excellence, and actually Michael is really steward of uh, that council and is in large part responsible for the success of this study. A um, lot of press the last couple of weeks. Um, what it does is produce data which is too complex to ask people. So I won't bring you through all of these numbers, but here's a profile of how people use the four screens. Everything that you see shaded in blue is their television screen, and basically what you would see, if you could read those numbers, I don't know if you can, is that people use um, TV total screen time 363 minutes a day. Of that, 309 minutes is live. Um, you can see big differences by age. Um, and you can also see who's using the purple uh, color there is um, uh, gaming consoles. The orange is the second screen, which is um, uh, their computer screen, and then the purple over on the right is mobile. So again, there's no way you're going to develop a survey instrument to measure this kind of behavior. Ironically, we have meters that do this. I could produce essentially the same uh, diagram with our meters, and we did. And what was really mar remarkable about this study is you've got phones and internet and television metered, then you have them doing this observational study there's about 500 people, two observations, the full day. The numbers came out to be almost exactly the same in terms of total television time viewing um, and total use of all these other screens. So it's quite remarkable. Okay, this is my personal favorite. Uh, second form of electronic ethnography. We have for 18 months been sending out cell phones to people, no cell phones are prompted to collect information as our clients need them. So in one case, every time you opened your wallet, you were asked to take a photograph of the environment in which you're opening your wallet. Uh, in another case, every time you went to the refrigerator, you were asked to take an environment of what the counter was, of what was inside of the refrigerator. Uh, another time, and it was a pilot that I experimented uh, in, I was a subject in, every hour I got prompted, very small amount of information, text, two or three text questions, and then take a picture, automatically pings it uh, back up to our computers. The next series of questions can be contingent on, upon what you said. Uh, and this is another example of using technology, such as take a picture of the pantry. Can imagine an RDD, call, or telephone, sorry, uh, calling a house, asking people to enumerate all the food that they have in their pantry. Or I'll send you a camera, and once a night, I'd just like you to open the door, take a snapshot of the pantry. It'll automatically ping the data up to us. Oh, and we might ask you a question or two based on what we see in that picture. Um, clients love it. It's great stuff. It brings data to life like you cannot believe. Um, and it's why I think I personally am so sell sold on um, mobile moving forward. Okay, just two other forms of watching. Um, GPS. 
you're not going to go give somebody a GPS just to watch them travel around town. That's what this is. Um, those green areas are billboards, and the little dots are like by the minute where the car was marked. And so if the car goes through the green area, it's in the audience for the billboard. This is uh, Los Angeles. But triggering questions based on knowledge of your, of your subject's locations is a great ability to have. Um, when, we, when we collected this data, it probably cost us about $500 a unit to build the GPS unit ourselves. Right now, you can get them off the shelf for probably about, probably about $30. That would do exactly the same thing. And they have uh, a USB port that will dump the data down. And then finally, my final piece of technology is this. Who, who knows what this is? Anybody? Take a look at the map. That'll be a sure giveaway. It's the greatest mashup of social networks and GPS. It's Google Latitude. So Latitude is basically a social network that if you give um, Google permission, they will get in touch with all your friends and um, at, at your will, you can basically look and see where all your friends are on a map um, and do the rest of the social network stuff at the same time. Now, this appeals to some demos more than others. <laughs> um, the reason for showing it is not whether you really want to be known by your friends where you are at all times. But um, I, I won't name companies, and I don't want to imply anything about Google. I will just say that in the last four weeks, I've probably been in touch with four social network mobile device companies that have asked for meetings about how to create product out of the massive databases that they're collecting. You can just imagine the kind of data that sits here. It's location, it's friends, it's when they get together, it's where they get together, it's where they've been beforehand. It's really a fantastic database. And if you go, you go to TED website, for example, on the landing page, there's always somebody up there talking about crowdsource, taking information out of the air, all that information that exists, and turning it into um, whatever it is that you need to find out. So I think that, that's almost sort of the piece de resistance in terms of um, data out there, mashed up data that are out there, which if properly mined, comma, privacy issues, fully considered. Um, I, I'm, I realize I'm making a big leap here, but, but um, privacy issues dealt with. Um, it really could produce, in, in my client's minds, fantastic data. So this is sort of my classical gas of technology, uh, but, you know, I'll give you my, I'll give you my Dave Letterman, you know, um, social network, GPS travel, um, privacy issues being dealt with. Yeah, I, I think there's going to be a real future in that because the costs are all analytical. You're not paying anyone anything additional for it. Um, same with GPS. Cell phone, I, 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 the shiniest eyes I've ever seen in my clients. I have, I have one technology client where we did it um, for um, their segments, their people. And uh, basically, we took images of where they were and who they were with. And they took the faces of the real respondents, and they morphed them together. So now, instead of showing an avatar or some, somebody which was kind of you know, a headshot of some model, it was actually sort of the digitized average faces of people who were in the, in the and of course, they made great you know, bragging rights uh, about this. Um, Ethnography, I think there's definitely a place for ethnography. I, I don't know how you will use ethnography other than to really in-depth qualitative to understand people uh, and their motives. Um, listening is probably got more opportunity than almost any of these technologies. Um, I put this up. This is Obama and his Blackberry. And I don't know if you've tracked Blackberry sales, but in terms of selling hope, um, if I actually had a full slide on this, you would see during the campaign, BlackBerry shares go, share of the mobile market go from 2% to 8%. And they just reported their, I guess it was first quarter earnings, and they had a fantastic first quarter. So images is, uh, is everything. Um, listening, t looking at TV uh, tells you something about where consumers are heading. If there's a ton of CNBC watching, it's not good for retail stores two weeks later. And we actually, I, I got so much of this data, we actually did it. We, we looked at the lag 
between panic CNBC viewing and what happened in retail stores two week, and it's two weeks is what the lag is. We'll fix online. Uh, it's here for good. And uh, finally, um, let's just close with a happy thought for the census, and that is they're going electronic. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kenneth Pruitt. Uh, Ken is a Carnegie Professor of Public Affairs and Vice President for Global Initiatives at Columbia University. He has served previously as Director of the U.S. Census Bureau, President of the Social Science Research Council, Senior Vice President of the Rockefeller Foundation, Director of the National Opinion Research Center, and Professor at the University of Chicago. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Academy of Political and Social Sciences, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. His most recent books are The Legitimacy of Philanthropic Foundations and The Hard Count, The Political and Social Challenges of Census Mobilization. He is currently working on a volume entitled Racial Counting in America, Past, Present, and Future. Ladies and gentlemen, Ken Pruitt. Oh, thanks. I have no pictures, only words. Um, and I'm supposed to be argumentative with our previous speaker. Um, obviously, I, I disagree with none of the facts that he put on the table, but I just want to make one quick observation. We use information not just to deliver products. We actually try to use information to deliver policy to our population. And um, I'm going to talk about where we stand with respect to the information base for delivering policy in a democracy. Uh, the decennial census is obviously the starting point uh, of that conversation. It has uh, the unique characteristic that it's supposed to find everyone in the country. Obviously, it does not do that. We'll talk about that in detail tonight. But its ambition, its aspiration, is to reach everyone. And that seriously, seriously matters. Because whatever we mean by democracy, whatever we mean by providing policy uh, to deal with social issues and so forth and so on, we expect those to reach the population, the target populations most in need of them, where they make the most difference. The problem is the decennial's in trouble. Uh, we know that. The household as a unit of analysis is crumbling, and yet that is the unit of data collection and data uh, analysis. We know, of course, that the ha not only the household, but the features associated with the la household historically. Uh, it has an address and a phone. Uh, households don't have addresses and phones anymore. Individuals have addresses and phones. We carry them around with us. They're in our pocket right now. Uh, we get all of our mail on our email, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, of course, the decennial's in trouble because it's getting harder and harder to count the full population of this country. I don't know what you think we'll do in 2010, but if there are 12 million undocumented and we even count half of them, which will be difficult in this environment, that means you start this census with a 3% undercount before you start. And, therefore, it will climb as you run into other population groups for whatever reason can't be found. Without a good decennial, you don't have the right sampling weights for everything else. You don't have a frame. And so I'm a, and I'll get to that in a second, I'm fully sympathetic with the enormous amount of data that's being produced by the digital revolution. And I will talk about that. But the one fundamental thing it does not have is representativeness. It gets everybody who has a cell phone, or everybody who Twitters, or everybody who's got a GPS attached to their car, or everybody who's got any one particular piece of that, or it searches piece of that technology. But the same people that's hard to find in a census are left out of that apparatus. And that spells a very big problem, it seems to me, uh, for uh, the American democracy. So that's my, my starting point. Um, I, I know that this is a, a, a smart audience, and therefore I think you can hold in your head a um, nine-cell matrix um, at, without even a slide of it. 
So here's the nine cell matrix I want you to hold in your head. I think we have to be concerned with respect to the information that we need for a democracy about data quality, data confidentiality, and data access. Access because we need analytic work on it. So quality, confidentiality, access. You got one dimension in your head. Horizontal dimension. We're looking at a society with three different huge kinds of information. Survey, census survey data. That's your enterprise. You know all about it. Administrative data, huge amounts of it. Talk about that in a second. And then, of course, the swipe data, the uh, location data, the cell phone traffic, the search patterns, the digital footprint that those of us who are plugged into that world uh, leave uh, every day by the tons and tons and tons of data, data points, as we know. So let's stick first with the, um, the vertical called survey information. That's been our bread and butter for about 75 years. Uh, going all the way back, of course, uh, using just the census, it's been the bread and butter since 1790. Uh, but let's just catch up with, with, with the, uh, the current um, uh, world that we're still living in, which is an enormous amount of information produced by going out and asking people questions. Yes, face-to-face, -face, yes, mail, yes, RDD, yes, cell phone, yes, maybe internet, but we fundamentally have a model which says we can get a lot of information we need about this society by asking people questions about health and education and transportation, um, uh, crime victimization, and so forth and so on. Now, in the 75 or so years that we have been collecting this information in this society, we've gotten really better and better at it. Sampling was the big breakthrough. You don't have to talk to everybody to learn a lot about the population. And sampling theory has gotten just enormously uh, sophisticated and perfected uh, by the academics working on it as well as government statisticians. And then non-response error, not to forget, our, our uh, non-sampling error, response rate problem, interview effects, mode effects, questionnaire construction, questionnaire ordering. There are 450 or 60 papers being given at this conference. They're full of sophisticated science on those kinds of questions, right? We're getting better and better and better at collecting information in a way which may not be our future. Now, move over to the next vertical. And we solved, I should say quickly, the issues of confidentiality and access. We store data, we let people access it, where it's highly uh, uh, confidentially sensitive. We create RDCs, research data centers. We create enclaves, licensing arrangements. We have, over the last quarter of a century, really, really uh, struggled with and solved the fundamental issues of making that information available for an analysis purposes. Survey research data has the scientific property of being variable rich, but case poor, with the exception of the decennial, of course. Uh, 1,500 cases, 5,000 cases, 20,000 cases, but we can put all kinds of important variables into that survey instrument. And that's why we can theorize on the basis of the data that we get. We get independent variables, intermediate variables, dependent variables, we can model the, the data. We can begin to explain stuff. And we have ridden that powerfully for uh, the, certainly since the end of the Second World War, in the social sciences, the statistical sciences, and the world that you all inhabit and publish in, and so forth and so on. But it's, it, it, it's, it's case poor. It's very expensive to go out and ask questions. But once you've got somebody, you can ask, and that's why the ACS gets in the long form and all that sort of stuff gets more and more, and then we start doing health surveys and education surveys and on down the line, always with the purpose of explaining whether if we do this, if we make this policy intervention, will it have the kind of consequences that we want for it? Quickly on administrative data. The government collects an enormous amount of administrative data, and we use some of it very effectively. Vital statistics, which are the bedrock of starting our whole analysis of the health care in this society, that's, after all, administrative data. School records, 
health records, SSA income earning records, IRS uh, income uh, wealth data, et cetera, et cetera. And we're beginning to use those data for analytic purposes. Now, it's tough because there's been a firewall between statistical data and administrative data. Administrative data, you're up against the confidentiality question big time because you have to keep the identifiers because those administrative data are, are collected in order to administer a program. I got to know whether it's in my social security check. Uh, if I keep crime statistics, I want to keep a record of who committed the crime. Obviously, IRS needs to know who we are and needs to keep our identifier data. So we have a big problem of solving the confidentiality question in administrative data. We have a huge problem in solving the quality data. If you think hard about administrative data, most of it needs to be right on a very small number of variables. If you've got to send a check to somebody based upon their earnings history, you have to know that earnings history. If you don't have the right address, but it gets to them anyway, and they don't complain, that's not your problem. School record data actually is pretty casual about a lot of the things that are on that record, but not where you live. If it's public schools, you've got to only in that district, you gotta, can't go to the school unless you live in that district, and so forth. So they want to get the address right. You try to merge those two data sets, you got one data set which really cares about the address, but not a lot about some other things, about the age or whatever, and the other data set that desperately needs to know age and our income earnings history and so forth, that doesn't care so much about the, uh, the, the, the nature of the address. And that, the administrative record stuff is littered with, for a particular program reason, you've got to get a very small number of things right. But you don't have to get everything right in that data record. And you don't have to get very much in that data record, just enough to administer the program. So administrative data are variable poor, but case rich. And if we're going to start, as I think we're going to, as I'll get to in a second, we're going to start migrating to a heavier use of administrative data, we're going to have to go to work on the quality of those data. And we have not even started. 460 papers at this conference on perfecting survey data. How many on perfecting administrative data? One, two, three. I couldn't find them looking through the program. How many courses do we teach in a research university about the quality of administrative data compared to survey data? Can't find them. Conferences on administrative data, three, four, five, maybe six a year. Conferences on survey data and sampling theory and so forth. Thousands, not thousands of conference, but thousands of participants coming to conference, ASA, here. Huge, huge difference between what we know as scientists about making survey data high quality and what we know about making administrative data of high quality. And then I said the confidentiality and the access problems are serious. Now move your mind over into the third column where we've got digital data. It's new. It's happening fast. It is case rich beyond belief. Incredible amounts of data, as you just heard from Paul. Um, it's variable thin. Uh, and they're struggling to make it better, and I think we will make it better. Um, but, you know, I know that the cell phone rings. I know somebody answered and how long they talked. If they got a GPS uh, built into it, I even know where they are and so forth. But I don't know a whole lot else about them. And I can't theorize just on the basis of some, uh, I can do some network analysis, some transaction stuff, but I can't begin to build the kind of social theory you need to build to create policy for a democracy. I was talking not too long ago to a group of European uh, heads of statistical agencies and census bureaus and so forth. and. Uh, maybe, I don't know, 80, 90 people in the room. Um, and I said, what, what's the ratio in your information system? I'm not talking about government uh, uh, people, not academics. What is the ratio in your information system of the use of survey-based information to administrative information? The average, average across Europe, at least on the basis of this 
not very scientific study, but these were the people who know, was basically we're 80% administrative data and 20% survey-based data. Our government is easily 80-20 the other direction and probably closer to 90-10. When I asked the Europeans, okay, you're 80, 80 administrative and 20 survey data, what's the direction of that trend line? Oh, they said, oh, it's still trending down. We've not finished. Germany doesn't take a census. Holland doesn't take a census. They take surveys, big, some important big surveys, but they get their fundamental information from administrative records. And I'll get back to that in a second. We are just at the beginning edges of the digital stuff as a data source. And it seems to me the biggest public choice to take seriously the title of this event, the serious, biggest serious public choice we face, is what is going to be the information system we're going to use to run our democracy, to govern ourselves, to form policy, and so forth. What is the ratio across these three domains? Survey-based, census-based data, administrative record data, and uh, digital surveillance kinds of data. I don't mean tomorrow, I don't mean even 10 years, but I mean in 25 years. I mean in our lifetimes, well, maybe give or take, uh, in our lifetimes. Um, uh, but, but, and that, that, it seems to me, is a choice the society is not yet prepared to make. It hasn't thought about how it's going to make it. Uh, and I think Paul's absolutely right. The, uh, the, it's going to happen. Something big is happening already in the digital world, but the government has not begun to wake up to it in any serious way as a source of information for helping to govern the society. Now, one other thing, and then I'll, I'll get to my major point. Um, I was fascinated by one of Paul's examples where he is trying, I don't mean Paul, but the, the data that he reported on, is trying to extract from the digital data kind of attitudinal characteristics or properties, uh, fear and hope uh, in, in, in one of his examples. Uh, and the word cloud is sort of, kind of begins to text, I mean, begins to, to, to extract some meaning about um, uh, variables in effect that we need in order to make sense of our society. Survey data, certainly of the sort that you're, not the government surveyed as much as what you're into, is fundamentally about how we think, what we believe, what we want, what we are afraid of, what we get angry about, what makes us happy. Um, and that's an enormously rich part of understanding ourselves as a society. And I really worry about trying to, I know the administrative record data won't give us that. It's not designed to do that. It's designed to administer a program. Uh, and if we begin to use it for other kind of purposes, it won't change radically from what it's already doing, because that's, that's why it's there. The government will start using administrative in part because the cost of collecting survey data are enormous. We know the census in um, uh, 2000 got close to seven billion, it's more than doubled in 2010. There's a certain point at which the government will say, why are we asking people when these questions where well, we can sort of get it out of the administrative records? Uh, and, and, and why don't we go to the commercial firms? And uh, this, this quit doing the CPI as a questionnaire. Let's just go out and get the swipe data on how much people spend for a box of, um, of cereal or what have you. Um, Already the BEA, um, Bureau of Economic Analysis, uh, which does the GDP, all the big economic lagging indicators, is beginning to buy swipe data uh, for exactly uh, those kinds of reasons. So we're at the edges of a real major transformation uh, that we have not, I'm afraid, uh, thought through. So um, I, I'm worried about losing <laughs> survey data because I think there's a really important domain that it's going to be better at than any alternative data set. And that domain is understanding us as people, as our fears and our wants and our desires, uh, our, our confidence, um, because we can still ask those questions and get interesting answers. We know better and better how to ask those questions and so forth. And I think that uh, that stuff matters if you're trying to figure out who we are and where we should be going. Uh, the whole study of prejudice was enormously important 
and, and making the kind of policy responses that gradually begin to transform the way we thought about outgroups and so forth. We need that kind of data to understand the way in which the new immigrant groups are going to incorporate in this society and so forth. And, and without a really rich body of survey data, I don't quite see how we're going to be nearly as informed about that set of variables. The kind of things you can watch people doing, the kind of things you can track down digitally, the kind of things you can get from swipe data, the kinds of things you get from administrative records. We could supplant a lot of the government survey data with those kinds of information sources. And that may be what we're headed toward. Uh, but I hope in the process that we retain some capacity as a society to do the kind of work that's done by APOR uh, and that someone will pay for it. It's expensive, and I'm not sure the government will pay for it, quite honestly. Uh, and uh, the government's now paying for part of it, of course, uh, in the contract houses and so forth, but not the kind of the stuff, that, the kind of now analytic work that you're doing. Uh, the government may not pay for that, at least as, as, as I see the long drift in, in, in front of us. So here's my, um, my problem. Um, I see a, a, a mixed bag of information, some survey-based, some administrative-based, some digitally-based. I see enormous quality problems, and I don't see the analytic work or the scientific attention yet to worry about the quality issues as you move from survey data to administrative data to digital data. And I most see a huge problem of representation. I see a problem where we're going to move, not I hope we won't move, but where we have a, a, a methodology that starts from the premise that you ought to count everybody and uh, that uh, into administrative record doesn't count everybody, it only counts the people in the programs, whatever they are, that's the way they're designed to do. And a digital data where the consciousness of the unrepresentativeness from the point of view of the entire society just isn't on the table and hasn't been on the table. Maybe we can get it on the table, but it's not been on the table uh, thus far. So I worry a lot about the fundamental issue of how can we, the Census Bureau talks about the hard to count and we've got to figure out some way to get the hard to count into the, into the decennial census if we're going to start with a sampling frame and sampling weights that really captures the entire population. Um, but the, the hard to count, of course, in a census are exactly the kind of people who don't have mobile phones, aren't Twittering, uh, aren't Facebooking and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and that, that, that digital world will simply leave them completely um, out, out of the picture. And I don't particularly want to live in a democracy where a whole large part of the population is, lived, is left out of the picture. What are we going to do? Sadly, 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 um, I think the, I'm not going to talk at length about this, I promise you, but the sampling, uh, the fact that the sampling issue has been pushed back into the political um, world this last several weeks, or really since Greg, uh, Secretary of Commerce Greg was nominated and then withdrew, uh, is very, very unfortunate. Uh, I think all of us who lived through the, the battles in 2000 had hoped with the decision not to put um, an adjusted census or dual system estimation, uh, even sampling for non-response, uh, back into the design in 2010. We just thought it wouldn't even hardly come up. And it's come up and it's there and maybe it'll drift away after the hearing and after Bob is in place and after the people start thinking about the real problems of getting a good decennial. But it's just interesting to me how toxic that word is. So I don't know, and I do, but I do know the following, that we're not going to have any good count of the hard to count uh, without some sort of sampling strategy. Uh, and are, and I'm now, I don't know, happily or unhappily, I can't tell, coming to the conclusion that I would actually rather fight the battle about national registration than about sampling. Uh, a national registration as our baseline number for the population, which then can do sampling weights and then can do a sampling frame and so forth. Our a national registration may be uh, the only way that we are going to be able to include everyone in, at some point into the information base that we're going to need to, to run our country, uh, make public policies. Uh, I'm still worried about that position, but I, I, I guess if I had to fight a battle right now, I think I would prefer to fight that battle than we fight the sampling battle, uh, oddly, uh, as silly as it is, really silly. Uh, I was talking to, I, I just, anyway, I, I, you, 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 you can tell. As I said to somebody the other day, I said, you know, just the next time somebody says they don't think 
we should sample, just to ask him. I said, well, when they go to the doctor and want a blood test, they say, take it all out? Uh, you know, uh, you know, it's just, you know, when they, when they get up in the morning and decide they want to carry an umbrella or not carry an umbrella, they look out every window or just one window. I mean, it's just, uh, um, but we've, we've gotten ourselves into this odd, odd, odd uh, pickle. And uh, whether we'll get rationality on that score or not, uh, I don't know. Okay, final. I mean, not final. I'm being redundant now. But I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that the digital data set is big and important and powerful, and there's much that can be learned about it. It has defects. Uh, I am absolutely convinced that the government will want to start using, make heavier and heavier use of administrative records. But I'm equally convinced that the enormous scientific attention that's gone into making survey data that leads to all the papers that are being presented at this conference hasn't woken up to the fact that pretty quickly, maybe more quickly than we think, uh, there's going to be a movement to these other two major sources of information. And I just hope that we will organize ourselves to worry about data quality, data confidentiality, and data access as intelligently as we have about the survey stuff. Thanks. Thank you both. Now it's, and now it's time to hear from, uh, from the floor here. We actually have four, I believe, uh, microphones. One here, one in back, one over there, and one over there. Um, and while folks are lining up, or going to the restroom, coming back and lining up, um, let me throw out a question to, to, to the both of you that deals more with, with everyone here in the, in the organization. From your perspective and what you just said, what does APOR need to do, if anything, um, to ensure, both in the short and the long term, to ensure that the organization remains viable and relevant in today's environment? Uh, and the answer is not uh, 1960. Uh, so I think it's essentially um, what Ken and I both said. Um, we were at the table before talking about what the content of the papers, and I was happy to see, I looked at the bulletin board before I started talking about online sampling, and I was happy to see that there are three sessions on online quality. And in terms of RDD, there are two or three sessions on address-based sampling. And, but, but those are the near-term problems. Those are the problems that we're having right now. Those are what I know I'm selling product, and I call them clients. And I know you're doing policy, so you call them something other than clients. Um, but those are today's problems. Um, I guess I agree with Ken. I didn't see anything on that board, which is really tomorrow's problems. And if you're not working on them now, it's, it's already too late. The only other thing I would add is, I just mentioned to Ken, I thought we were in violent agreement on things. Your administrative data is exactly analogous to our server-based data. We, we are a company that probably has half its revenues based on surveys, on panels, and the other half of its uh, revenues are based on um, servers, which are equivalent to your admin. And, and totally analogous. Um, server data has big, big holes, and I've probably spent the last couple of months working on how to fill the holes that are in those server databases. So even though I'm selling product and you're selling policy, I think there's probably a lot that we can learn from each other about dealing with um, this, I call it an opportunity because I think it is for the future. Well, I, 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 uh, let me just uh, underline what Paul just said. Um, I, I think there's going to have to be a much, much healthier conversation between the commercial sector and the academic sector than there has been. Um, uh, especially because the commercial sector is going to gravitate much more rapidly to different kinds of data sources than, than the academic community has. Uh, though they're starting. I mean, there's something called computational uh, social science, and it's starting to do this kind of work. I went to a fascinating conference on that in Princeton just three weeks ago called Studying Society in a Digital Age. Uh, there were three of us there, Paul DiMaggio, Paul Starr, and myself. Uh, who were kind of like the graybeards, and the average age of the rest of the participants was must have been 18 and a half. I don't know, um, but uh, but boy, they're they're churning out fascinating stuff. Um, um, I, I thought it was theoretically thin, but it was really complicated and data rich. Um, so I and so there, the stuff's happening, and these are people from Google and Yahoo and and Microsoft. Um, not just academics, but people in those settings in in places like Nielsen. And I think that uh, we simply have got to structure a more intelligent conversation across that line because we're going to need each other. And I think 
the reason that I want this crowd to sort of stay alive, <laughs> if you will, in a big sense, is I think you carry a commitment to data quality that uh, hasn't migrated into those other circles uh, nearly as much as it is in the world that we live in. Um, and so data quality, confidentiality, access, all the things that we've built our enterprise on, um, and you fundamentally understand representational uh, issues. How representative is this, is this of the larger population, not just the particular uh, group that's uh, uh, at stake? Questions? Now, this is not a shy group, so y'all get up. Somebody, <laughs> microphones, questions. Well, let me, let, me, let me tweak you a little more then. The uh, small shops, most of the, we've got a large contingent here of folks that are at university shops. They've done particular types of research for many decades. Um, much of what we know in terms of science uh, of surveys has actually come from these shops. Um, and what I see is a future where a lot of these shops wind up closing their doors, whether it's economically or because they simply aren't given the, the resources to be able to make the transition into this new environment. So I don't know if you have any thoughts or views on, on that particular issue. Uh, yeah, I really do. Um, that Ball State study was $3 million. Um, that's a small shop, and they were doing something that is out there. So if you're a small shop, you're nimble, and there's absolutely no excuse for you not moving faster than the big shops. Ken? Well, I, no, it's a tough one, um, um, that one, and, and I do worry about losing our university-based uh, capacity. Um, look, we've already lost a lot of the, our capacity in university as, as it's moved to the big contract houses, including the for-profit contract houses. Um, uh, ISR and NORC, the only ones can even imagine competing on some of the big surveys that are coming out of the government at this stage. Um, some of you know, I'll say it, maybe none of you know, I'll say it nevertheless, I was very unhappy when the National Election Study um, moved from Michigan to RTI um, uh, for that reason. Uh, um, and uh, I, because I, I just hated to see it leave its university setting. I, I don't know, I don't know, I mean, look, there's no magic answer to your question. Um, I do think that um, if the university suddenly, the university setting suddenly begin to worry about the data quality questions uh, in other than survey data, then somebody's going to pay for that. The government's going to pay for that because they're going to use administrative data, and the corporate sector may pay for it because they're going to use digital data. And now, they may do that work in-house, but if they thought the universities were doing a good job, uh, they would pay for it, uh, I think. So I, I would just, your scientist, lead with your strength, which is how do you make sure the stuff is good? Thank you. A question over here, just announce uh, who you are and uh, what your question is. Hi, uh, my name is Jerry Kosicki. I'm from Ohio State University. Um, I'm really curious uh, to ask Dr. Pruitt about uh, his thoughts on this question. Why does our society seem to have so much trouble counting something that ought to be pretty simple, which is votes in elections? <laughs> <laughs> Look, the, the, the simple answer to that is um, something so decentralized uh, as, as the electoral system. Uh, I, I think if it were centralized, uh, run as a national apparatus, we would do a much better job of it. Um, but it is decentralized, therefore you run into local budget off issues in counties and cities and, and so forth. There are some places that, you don't, that don't care how well they count, but I don't, I don't, I'm not conspiratorial about it. I don't think that's the big news. I think the big news is the sheer decentralization. And it's like a lot of things. It's like the decennial census. Uh, when it's not in front of you, you don't think about it. To really count well, you've got to plan continuously and improve continuously. Uh, and so you get the, the, the Florida issue and you get all excited about it and you say this is going to happen and then it goes away and so forth and so on. You forget about it. It's like the decennial. Uh, it takes 10 years, 12 years to get ready for a decennial, but you've only got money for three or four of those years. And you're basically a stepchild the other six or seven years. Um, and I, that, I don't think it's nefarious. I just think it's party in the structural thing. And I would love to see a serious uh, uh, national responsibility for the quality of elections. We have a question in the back. No, then over here. Uh, Jim Newswanger from IBM. Regarding the first presentation and sampling issues aside for a minute, beyond individual Web 2.0 technology adoption, the fact is that organized decision making is occurring online today, and you actually didn't really get into the ways in which groups are attempting to make decisions through prediction markets, 
online today, and I see that as definitely an emerging trend. I mean, the basic example would be just social search and the way in which collectively groups of people attempt to identify the right answer for a search, but prediction markets, the Iowa markets, Hollywood Report or whatever the example is, are emerging. So do you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I can't say that I'm an expert on it, although I'd love to because it's a fascinating field. I, I, mine was really like a 101 sort of survey, as you can imagine. But I mentioned a couple of TED lectures. And um, there's a guy, Eric Herman, I think, on the, the landing page of uh, TED right now. And he goes into exactly that kind of thing, the, the massive amounts of information and how do you actually create filters? It's called crowdsource uh, information filters. How do you create filters so that you work all that information down into something which creates manageable decisions? Um, so it's, it's, you're absolutely right, it's there. There are experts much better at this to speak to this than I am. Um, it was my 101 survey course, so I apologize. I'll bring the expert in on that the next time. Surprisingly, there are no presentations on it here, but it's a very interesting emerging area. Uh, in the back. Yes, uh, Paul Johnson from Western Watts. I want to start by relating a really quick experience. I was at one of these industry conferences, and one of the biggest quotes while I'm sitting there at a dinner table is someone who's building these online panel communities uh, specifically for uh, products told me that their clients don't care blankety blank 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 about uh, representation at all because the people who are on their panel are their product leaders and they were the ones who influence everyone else. That is where I'm scared. I'm scared that this digital information is running faster than it's able to and we're not answering the important questions of especially baby boomer generations who don't use Twitter, who don't use these uh, high tech informations and I don't think it's gonna change in five years, yes, 50 years from now, the digital information really will become representative and more representative, but I don't think it's going to happen in the near future, and I think it's running faster than it's able to. Comment? That, uh, that was actually the point that I was trying to make. I mean, those words sounds like the words of an unscrupulous uh, survey sample provider. Um, I think clients do care about quality. Kim Dedeker's speech, now that's P&G and they move the market and they, I wouldn't say they were ready to walk away from online, but they were looking at all other opportunities to get information in other places as they started to understand that online samples were, uh, were not of the quality that was required. Um, I, I don't know, I thought in my presentation, for, for somebody who does three million online surveys a year, I was about as critical of online sample quality as you would expect, um, but I do think it's fixable. And I think that there are initiatives underway. We have, no, I know there's many companies in this room that are doing a lot of work in this area. Um, and, and it's a matter of uh, uh, tagging people, um, not with a cookie, uh, but with another technology that is not so easy to um, eliminate. And therefore, you, can, you know exactly who the, the, the duplicators are and the, where the overlap is. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm certainly I'm certain what Paul just said is correct, obviously people in this business care about quality, but I'm not so sure they care f as about representativeness as, as the policy process has to or should. Um, uh, the pharmaceuticals uh, want to sell drugs, and that doesn't mean they don't care about the quality of the drug, but they have a target audience. And uh, knowing about the target audience so they can market this drug to that target audience makes sense to them, so they're going to be very good about having measured the characteristics of the target audience. And people outside that target audience does, doesn't matter. They're not the targets for that particular uh, uh, product. I don't, th that doesn't bother me. I wouldn't expect the commercial sector uh, to be terribly concerned about the people who fall outside of their target audiences. Why should they? Uh, uh, that's not their business. Um, but a government doesn't have a target audience. It has the entire population of the country as its responsibility. Uh, and so it has to worry uh, about representativeness uh, when it draws its information base. So if its information base is distorted, and the problem with the, um, with the undercount is that, look, let, let me just finish on this. I mean, now that I've got the mic, I guess nobody will stop me. But uh, um, <laughs> Think hard about the decennial. Uh, it's, it's aspirations to count everyone. It, it can't. If it counts every population group, 
and every geographic region proportionate to the size of that population group in geographic reason, then it's a fair census. It's a fair census because overwhelmingly the results of that count in the policy process are allocated on a share basis, not in terms of absolute numbers. The simplest were the 435 seats in the United States Congress. Obviously, that's on a share basis. So if every population group is represented proportion to its true size in the population and every geographic reason, then the census can still do its task because very, very few things are allocated, some few things, but not much on an, on an absolute number base. It's almost always on a share basis. But what makes the census unfair is to count some parts of the population better than other parts of the population. People with phones, people without phones. People with fixed addresses, people without fixed addresses. People who want to be counted, people who don't want to be counted. So as soon as you have a lumpy census and you're allocating things on a share basis, you've got an unfair census, you've got an undemocratic census. At least the census is worried about that. I know the Census Bureau is worried about that, and most members of Congress are worried about that. Not all, uh, sadly. Uh, but, but for the most part, they are worried about it. So you've got an argument. But the commercial sector, I don't know why it should worry about counting the homeless. It's not their job. They're not trying to sell products to the homeless. No, but uh, we do, actually. Um, I think. I, sorry. And maybe, maybe it's not homeless. Look, so a tenth of a point, a tenth of a rating point in television over the course of a season is worth over $100 million to a network. In my short term at Nielsen, I have so far been through two Senate hearings, one court case about quality. Um, there's a tremendous amount of money on the line. Um, I have a, a close relationship with um, the Hispanic and the African American caucus. Um, we, we have a strong um, uh, per people in Washington um, that were in constant contact um, on both the Hill and, and in the Senate. Um, it, I, I believe personally that the television panel, which is just one of many, many of our panels, is probably the best sample outside of the census uh, in terms of representing uh, Hispanics and African Americans. So we spend a fortune on it. Um, not all panels require that kind of expense or quality. Um, internet, um, I'm, I'm currently going through um, exactly the same discussions with internet. We are the most heavily audited research organization that I know. Our internet measurement service is currently going through what's called MRC accreditation, which is total transparency. Ernst & Young um, does the most detailed audit of methodology that I have ever seen. And not just do you say what you do, but they visit homes, they, as detailed as anything that I've seen. I'm always in discussion with Telemundo and Univision about representation, because it's obviously very, very hard to get Spanish dominant households into panels like internet panels. Um, we do a very good job on television. We're trying to do a much better job uh, on internet, and we'll get there. And we won't get accreditation until we get there. And it even has entered now the consumer uh, realm in terms of our home scan panel, which measures consumer packaged goods. So the, the pressure is there, the importance is there, the lobby behind it. Um, if, if we were to not do a decent job measuring Latino households in our consumer uh, goods division, um, it, it, it would be, a, I don't know how to describe this, but be, it would be tough for us. It would, there would be a, um, a lot of discussion with the Hispanic clients, and we, we won't do that, so we'll do the, we're doing the best that we can. Okay. Over here. Uh, I'm Tom Gooderbach from University of Virginia, and I like everything you all are saying and agree with almost all of it, but one thing, I came up short on one thing. Ken Pruitt, if I heard him correctly, suggested that we, we're in a democracy, we want to count everybody, and um, we have uh, th those mobile devices aren't in the hands of those hard to count people. But the fact is that the 23 year old black man in Philadelphia who lives half time with his mom and half time with his girlfriend that you can't count has a cell phone in his pocket, and so does the 19 year old Hispanic girl uh, who just came over the border in Arizona. She's got a cell phone too. And we are calling cell phones. Uh, we heard a lot about the death of RDD, and I agree that's. Landline RDD, list assisted, has huge problems. But we are combining that with cell phone calling. And so it seems to me that's one technology that's, that we are transforming in our work here. And it's becoming 
the one practical and affordable technology that reaches virtually everybody across language, across demographics. If you look at those cell phone demographics and combine them with the others, you really are reaching everybody. I just wonder what your comment is on that. And Michael, I know you've worked on this problem yourself. You might have something to say. Um, well, no, I, I'm, I, I, obviously, one can only be enthusiastic about what you said, but just don't forget the problem of the decennial census. Um, it's got to put some place, it's got to put somebody in a household. Uh, and so reaching somebody on the cell phone doesn't solve the decennial census problem. Uh, people have got to be located in a residence because that's how we draw uh, the redistricting lines and all kinds of other political lines on the basis of the decennial count. So, um, I, I, I would like to see the census go uh, break free of the household as a unit of analysis. Uh, that's really tough, really, really tough when you put your mind around that, that uh, sort of simple-minded statement. But uh, I just don't see that the household as the unit of analysis is going to be, is going to last uh, certainly um, uh, through, through this century. Uh, it just, the number of unrelated people living uh, and the, you know, the kind of case you just half here and half there, the child is moving around, um, uh, house, households form and disperse and form again, uh, uh, in, in, in certainly in college areas and so forth and so on. All of those people, or a high percentage of them, have a cell phone, so you can find them. But the real tough issue is how do you locate them in, the, in, a, in, in their normal place of residence? And until you can do that, you can't use that piece of information for, for the decennial, and that matters a lot. Very briefly, uh, let me address what, what, what you said. My personal view, having done quite a bit of this, obviously, is uh, it's short term that it, it certainly fits a niche right now, and there, there are certain types of surveys, particularly those that need to move very quickly overnight, polling, those types of things, where that might be the only uh, alternative, certainly, that we have on, on the caddy side. But I just, I certainly just don't see it looking long-term as being the, the solution. Uh, I, and I, I personally don't think there is any one solution. There are gonna be multiple solutions, and that's where, personally, uh, just as a researcher, I think we need to, to wind up going, looking in multiple different directions. In the back. Uh, Diane Bowers, I'm uh, with CASRA, which is the uh, National Association for Research Agencies. Um, I'd like to point out, make a comment first and then ask a question. My comment, my first comment is that uh, I think research, whether it's done for a commercial entity or for a nonprofit agency or for the government or uh, involved with social research, um, is all the same. Our populations may be smaller if we're doing um, research for a pharmaceutical company. Uh, indeed, however, uh, we try to be representative uh, in that effort. So my question is, is, is it seems to me in my long history um, in this industry that we operate in silos. Um, government research does government research, academic research is uh, dealing in that arena, and the so-called commercial side of the industry, um, which I don't consider to be commercial, we just make money at it, hopefully, um, is, is really um, working, doing work with uh, businesses and corporations, et cetera. We have a problem, a clear problem in the industry that I think I agree with Paul is an opportunity, that we do have a wealth of data, we have a wealth of knowledge and uh, science application to solve it, but I think we somehow can't seem to break out of the mold that we're cast in and somehow work together, because I think it's a problem that's solvable, but I frankly don't think we can do it in each segment alone. Do you have any comments on that? Um, I, I, I agree completely with what you said. I do think that there's um, slivers of hope um, we are starting to work with universities and academia. Ball State was one example of it. Um, but we're also starting to um, essentially outsource a lot of the work that we do to universities, um, R&D, engineering, that kind of stuff. And on the government side, um, I'm af almost afraid to name the agencies because I'm afraid someone will say something and mess up the deals. But, <laughs> but um, we, are, we are finding government agencies coming to us asking us about acquiring scanner data 
maybe it's some of the stuff that you feared, Ken, that, that uh, agencies would go to commercial rather than universities. Um, but we're finding ourselves, we have a whole government unit that we just set up. We, we see that there's so much opportunity there. So I, I think it's starting to happen, but it's just barely starting to happen. Just another, thing. no, I didn't mean to say I, I, I didn't oppose the government trying to get a commercial data if it meets the quality standards and the representational standards that I think we ought to have. I think, um, no, I, I think there's enormous kind of partnership that can be worked out across the three, the three uh, domains. Uh, I wouldn't make them academic commercial. I, I actually think we have three big different information sources and we have to figure out how to get those three things to, to talk to each other if we're going to have a very serious information driven uh, public policy process. Um, but the, uh, uh, I, I don't think we've figured out yet. The, 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 the conversation between the government and the commercial sector has got to start by understanding what the rules of proprietary data are. Uh, there are commercial data that make sense because some commercial actor has a market advantage because they know something that their competition doesn't know. And that's what you would expect. That's why we have pat patents and intellectual property rights and so forth. Um, but, but moving commercial data into the government, government sector or, or creating some sort of partnership there means that there's got to be a release of proprietary data into the public record. The government should not be dealing with data that everybody doesn't have access to. They don't have a transparent government anymore. So you have to solve the proprietary data issue, and I'm not sure quite where we are on that one. Most of our data is syndicated. It's not proprietary. It's on, I mean, if we did a custom, I can't see the government come to, coming to us to do a custom study. Um, what they're interested in is store scanner data, retail sales. So you can imagine the applications for it. You know, we can conduct surveys on consumer behavior, or we can actually find out exactly how much product moved last weekend. And that was kind of the point of my slides, that the ability um, to, to tell the government that something happened and then two weeks later, a whole lot of home furnishings moved because of wh whoever said whatever. And so that, that really is happening. And I was, I was glad to hear you say, Ken, that you make policy because I was very careful to say that we, we're not doing policy. We're doing short term, are the consumers spending one week or two, week, two weeks after the administration says something and that will, that will help them learn about communications and marketing. It doesn't necessarily have that sort of long-term value in terms of policy setting, but it will tell them whether something's going to pop the next week or so. Last question. I, Alan Barton from University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Uh, having taken a course with C. Wright Mills when he was writing The Power Elite. Uh, I wonder what this concentration of data on the population does to the power structure. What does it do for corporations versus consumers, uh, for ordinary citizens versus governmental security agencies and so on? Well, <laughs> um, I, I uh, also sat at the feet of C. Wright Mills um, as a graduate student, not at Columbia, but in other settings. Um, you know, there's a, uh, the decennial census runs its ads and cheerleads and so forth and says, and says to the American public, we need you to cooperate uh, because we're here to deliver a service. We're here to make sure your community gets the right share of federal dollars and that you get represented in Congress and so forth and so on. Um, but I just know that there is latent in the population, and without being able to put a number on it, but it's there, how many I can't say, there is a sense that this is all about surveillance. It's not about delivering a service. Uh, and there's historical evidence sometimes where people have migrated from their societies, use the census data for surveillance purposes. Uh, we have actually used ours for surveillance purposes, of course, at different times. Um, so there is a kind of a tension, it seems to me, uh, in, in this kind of, why are we collecting this information? Is it actually to deliver a better public policy, deliver a set of social services, or is it to try to sell us something, 
or is it to try to pay attention to us just in case there's need to sort of um, uh, bring the weight of the state down on this, that, or the other? Um, and so I, I think it's a, very, it's a very important question that you ask. Um, the, the, the capacity of the society, and this is what the whole Poindexter data mining thing was about, uh, the capacity to, with, with powerful algorithms and data mining, to extract stuff from the digital data. And what obviously has to worry about, we have to worry about, is the digital data are full of false positives and false negatives. Um, you know, you, you think you're following me around when you put a GPI in my cell phone, but that's the week I gave it to my son who was in, in, in town, you know. And so you followed him, but you thought you were following me, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so there's a, there's a way in which if we don't get to the, the quality issues, then, then the risk are even higher, because I think there is the capacity in this society, any society, under, under threat, uh, under certain kinds of conditions, to want to use that enormous data set uh, to, uh, to police against certain kinds of behaviors, against terrorism, against criminality, uh, against cheats, against fraud, and so forth. And the government, on the census side of the game, the survey side of the game, has been very, very good at making sure that doesn't happen. But once we start breaching some firewalls between survey, census data, and administrative data within the government, let alone commercial data, we're going to have to create altogether new firewalls. And there has to be some sort of a high degree of surveillance, if you will, of the government's use of information if we want to make sure. Once the, once the population turns negative, uh, and, and co cooperation rates are already, as we well know, um, uh, risky and, and fragile, and once the population or parts of the population turn, um, uh, turn suspicious, it's going to be very, very difficult. Then the government will really go to surveillance data. The, the thing about a survey is I have to come and ask you your questions, you can decide to answer or not answer. The, the problem of swipe data, GPI data, or GSI data, all the other kind of search engine data and so forth, nobody is asking that person whether I can collect that information. Uh, we're just doing it. Uh, there is no permission granted. And uh, that's not true, at least as of now, of, uh, and can't be true of survey data, even census data, even though it's mandatory and so forth. You still have to get some sort of active cooperation between the citizen and the collection of the data. Paul, Can I follow? Um, I'm actually going to approach your C. Wright Mills question from a different angle, but on the, on the privacy issue, um, I can't tell you how sensitive we are to this. And we have committees set up around personally identifiable information even, even our clients, even the mobile people, it, it is not the Wild West right now. No one's taking your location without you knowing it. And I, I won't have time to really go into how we would, uh, we would access that data, but it probably would be through a, a family of Nielsen panelists that we go to and say, you won't even know we're doing it, but do we have permission to you know, pull your GPS data off your phone? Um, so your, your concerns are well-founded, but I think legitimate companies are sensitive to that, and no one is risking, certainly no phone company uh, is risking um, that kind of privacy invasion. On, this, on the C. Wright Mills question, I'm, I, a different angle. It's very simple for me. Um, the cost of an airline ticket is cheaper because of Internet. The cost of a hotel room is cheaper because of an Internet. The cost of most goods and services now are cheaper because of Internet. Internet has brought economic, has reduced economic friction and brought value to consumers. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, there were two kids in Colombia. They got sick of, a, of a, an explosion. They organized on Facebook a worldwide uh, protest against terrorism. They had 14 million people on it. I think, I think Internet is creating opportunities for social action that heretofore never existed. Yeah, I just, I, I not, don't want to argue on this, Paul, but, um, but I did argue with someone from Google on this the other day. I said, why do you have to keep my identifier? Well, they said, we, uh, I said, no, why do you have to keep my identifier? When you, when you collect my search information, what I, what I searched last night. And the answer is they want to market stuff to me. <laughs> Uh, that is, I, I do think there is proprietary data in this sector, and I do think there is, is, is obviously sensitivity to privacy, and you're mm -hmm. talking about Nielsen, but not the whole enterprise. Mm -hmm. There are people for whom wanting to keep the identifier is very, very important for their purposes. Just, just that strikes me as... Yeah. A actually, let me define the ground rules. That doesn't surprise me about Google. I think where people are really concerned is letting that data go outside of Google. 
without a, a strong privacy policy in place. So, um, a, a, you know, a Verizon company will have access to GPS data, mobile triangulation will know where you are. A Verizon will not let that data go outside of uh, Verizon without something like what they do in the pharmaceutical industry where that guarantees privacy, uh, personally identifiable information can't travel anywhere. Well, gentlemen, given the hour, I think it's time that we let the audience go eat cake. So uh, please join me in thanking our two speakers. Thank you very much.